Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you all had a happy holiday. Uh, this is a, a very bittersweet moment here. This is our last meeting at 156. Uh, <laughs> I said bittersweet. I know it was uh, We'll be moving to two Lafayette for our next meeting next year. So uh, we have a, a packed schedule, so uh, let's go around the room and do introductions. Bill Chalmers. Hi, Anthony. I don't want to waste people's time traveling back and forth. I mean, if, uh, 
what makes this agency, I think, very effective is that we're small and we can work well together. And the fact that we were two buildings across the street from each other made life a lot easier. So we're going to be trying to do work around this challenge. Uh, but please bear with us. Please check which building you have a meeting with somebody at DYCB. The other big news, I think, that I think is worth noting is that we've been tasked with uh, working on a request for proposal for community schools. Um, on behalf of the Department of Education, we contact papers out. The comments are due on the 11th of December, uh, and we expect to issue the RFP sometime in mid-January. It will be one of seven RFPs left the remainder of the year, so the rest of uh, this year will be very, very busy. Um, and I'll be glad to take questions, but I want to make sure we have time for our guests. Uh, to Lafayette on the 14th floor, uh, that will be the equivalent of our auditorium there. I'm, I haven't seen the space, but I'm told it is, you know, that that building has got breathtaking views of the Manhattan skyline. What's the cross streets? Uh, not as bad as I thought. It's catty corner, catty corner from this, uh, City Hall. Yeah. Okay. Not well, City Hall, Little City Hall. Yeah. The big yeah. building. The municipal building. The municipal building. Yeah. To the corner. Lafayette and me. Right. Green Street. It's where they film all the TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, so, so we're going to have an ad to the agenda now. Um, so Sherazad uh, is going to give us an update on what's been happening in the workforce. Good morning, everyone. How are you?
So we want to make sure that there is one body that can really drive uh, the, the strategies, if you will, in terms of how these resources are utilized, spent, um, and evaluated. And we also want to make sure that the four core programs are in line with our citywide strategy, which Katie will speak to in just a few minutes. Um, so we'll be sharing the full um, recommendations at the next week meeting, and we'll be walking through them. So I hope they can join us for the week meeting, and they're also on our website. And the specific digital we can tell you that. to the agenda, since we have a form we want to do a vote now the minutes from the last meeting. So, yes. Yeah, just to, I was going to give to Anthony. Um, the people that are listed on here are not. They don't know that they're part of either the Youth Council or the Youth Board specifically, which I'll give to you. And I was at the meeting with the flex, so I wasn't. So I'll, I'll just give it to you. We'll make sure we add you. And, and there are a couple of other people that we need to look to be sure that they're still on your list. Any other additions? So all in favor accepting the minutes with those additions? Opposed? Thank you. So now the fun part of the meeting, the elections. So we, we, have, a nom we have a nomination for secretary. Uh, we are we are looking for nominations for the um, the vice chair of the board, and we are also looking for nominations if anyone else would like to nominate themselves for secretary. So the floor is open to any and all nominations. This is just for you. Just for you. <laughs> well, I think we're going to, we're, with, without any nominations, I think we're going to have to hold an additional meeting at the beginning of 2015 then to, uh, to elect the new board. So, uh, we'll, we'll notify you when that meeting will be scheduled, but in the meantime, please think about uh, nominations. We will be in touch with you. Uh, to ask you for nominations, and we hope to have this completed by January. So. All right, that's so what we'll continue. Um, all right, so next for our Jobs for New Yorkers Task Force report, um, Career Pathways, One City Working Together, uh, Katie Galston. Um, hello, everyone. I am um, happy to be in the presenting of this report. I think some of you have uh, probably perused the executive summary, um, which is a good start. Um, and then we have some of our members, Greg, uh, thank you for your service on the, uh, on the task force. And then, of course, Commissioner John. So um, what we, uh, I'll just take you through a little bit about what we've just released um, on November 14th. So, so people, uh, yeah, I don't have a, we don't make copies because we're trying to be conscious of that. So here is, um, here's what we did over the summer. So on May 20th at Brooklyn Army Terminal, uh, we announced our um, task force. We had 30 members. So we had 15 members from, um, from our workforce development providers, our advocates, um, and education, and then we had 15 members from business um, and labor uh, that were representing both the supply and demand side. We had task force meetings from June through September, and we had agency working groups that um, certainly um, DYCD and uh, others were key and in, involved in trying to figure out exactly how we would implement and what the priorities of each agency were. We also took, had a survey, so we had three things that we did. And the third one was the survey of the community engagement. We met with community leaders, and we had 15 roundtables, um, as well as a survey that was online in eight different languages. So we had over 810 participants to respond to, and we had advertised that with, as well as a roundtable with, um, organized by CDH to talk with the workforce. So based on that input, we came up with a recommendation. So let me just first define what do we mean by the workforce system. 
So in the workforce, it could be narrowly defined as just one funding stream, but that's not the way that we see it. We see it as uh, designed by many funding streams and um, all of these interacting uh, programs. And here you see that we approximate approximately $500 million in New York City is in the workforce system. And again, there's not like a particular funding stream or the definition. We're defining it this way. And because, and you can see it, HRA and DYCD are two of the most uh, largest budgets. And as we talk about, the re some of the reasons for that is because of the DYCD summer youth employment, obviously the budget for that is quite high because we're actually paying salaries. So it's not that you can just count programs and programs. A lot of these programs are different and they have different costs associated with that. Um, and we have four programs that account for 42 percent of the spending, and the two biggest ones um, are at uh, HRA, We Care Back to Work, and then we have Summer Youth Employment, and the Parks Opportunity Program, which is also a subsidized job program, which is why we have such a high price. So you can see that when we think about this, I also will point out CUNY. Um, this is obviously not their entire budget. This is a tiny portion, if you were, if this was a pie chart of CUNY, this is just our workforce development programming that's beyond just the regular continuum. So here was the landscape that we saw. First we saw, um, as everyone has in the national economy, a disappearance of middle skills jobs. Um, job growth since the recession has been concentrated in highway, um, either in high wage, high skill, a very, at the very top, or low wage, low skill, and a much bigger um, our fastest growing industries, retail and food and accommodation, have added over 100,000 jobs and are the worst paying industries. A typical food industry worker earns only $18,400 a year. And so that is greatly concerning to uh, many um, economies that we care about. So the second one is rising number of working poor with limited career opportunities. So that we have 1.4 million New Yorkers earning less than $30,000 a year in New York City. 54% of that 1.4 have a high school diploma or less, but no college education. And we can see very clearly, as you know, education correlates with um, earnings over life. And then, um, specifically around youth, in 2013, nearly a quarter of all young people aged 18 to 24 were neither working nor enrolled in school. And this is our either opportunity you know, or disconnect. Um, as you know, high school completion sometimes is no longer sufficient to obtain a middle income job, technical skills, or substantial work history are required. And in uh, 2012, the median annual earnings of workers with a bachelor's degree were nearly twice of those at the high school. That's just kind of um, That last one, I think, is just natural. Uh, so we, you know, we have a, a couple different sources. Um, and then, Lastly, employers face a shortage of high-skilled workers. So there's the, both the side, right, the supply and the demand side. So we have this, we, and we hear from employers that they're demanding <coughs> skilled workers, and they use educational attainment as a proxy for skill levels when they make hiring decisions. And then a long-term skills deficit will hamper the city's ability to retain employees and attract uh, and drive productivity, as well as attract new businesses and allow them to grow and thrive. We want to make sure our neighbors not being street. So this was some of the challenges that we um, saw when we took a scan of the city and then that combination. And then we saw that New York City's workforce system is not currently designed to specifically address these challenges. We saw an emphasis on rapid job placement, a uh, focus on the quantity of hires, not the quality of jobs, and opportunities for advancement. We saw more than two-thirds of the workforce budget has gone to programs that connect people to low-wage work such as retail and food service. And often such placements result in quick churn for an unskilled job before returning to the city to receive, um, I actually like it to say, instead of trying to seek more help, seek the exact same help, uh, which I think is the more, because seeking more help sometimes you can talk about a continuum, which is a good thing, but seek the exact same help. Um, for example, Commissioner Banks talks about people coming back, back uh, right back to cash assistance for the exact same service that they had received. More important piece. Um, so, uh, 500 million is not strategically deployed. It was really interesting. One of the things that um, the deputy uh, mayor and even myself, having worked in the system for a long time, um, you hear a lot. Well, we just need access to the programs. You know, we just need to get 
hear about the training program. The truth is that when we took a look, only 7% was actually invested in skills training. So it's not that there was a lack of access, it's that there simply was just very little, only $33 million invested in any skills training in any of the agencies that we had discussed. 70% um, was on matching and subsidized jobs, and subsidized jobs do not boast higher placement rates than matching programs um, at, afterward. Um, the fragmented system undermines utility. So we have coordinated service delivery um, of the 10 agencies, which I think you guys probably have discussed previously here. Um, each agency operates with separate metrics, data systems, and rules. And that is understandable due to the different funding streams and due to the different, um, in, in the historic ways that things are built up, but we still want to uh, address that as a problem. And last, economic development and seed purchasing is not always connected, uh, but rarely and only with good faith and workforce outcomes. So our goal is, you'll be shocked to hear, a transformational shift. Uh, this mayor likes transformational shifts um, of the workforce system. So we want to support career advancement and income mobility uh, by helping job seekers and permanent workers address educational needs and develop high demand skills. We want to ensure the businesses find the talent that they need right here. He's challenged us multiple times to make sure we're having homegrown talent and so we can educate them such a important part of leading that to be a Improve the quality of low-wage jobs to benefit both the workers and their employers. So this is about raising the floor and understanding that the largest growth is in these low-wage sectors and, and how do we address that. Leverage the New York City's economic development investments and purchasing power by placing more New Yorkers into jobs. And function as a coherent system that rewards job quality uh, instead of only quantity and using a system-wide job outcome data. Can you, could you just, it's the second time it says it in there, what is purchasing power? $17 billion that we spend on buying business services as well as contracts. In individuals or through contracts? Through contracts. Through everything. Everything we do. The whole thing the, the whole thing of the moon. Can we also measure before? Can we talk about leveraging the economic development of the investment to making it explicit that when the city subsidizes, say, a development project, that it would be sort of a mandate? So I'll go into that uh, in a little bit more detail, but you are right. Uh, but yeah, you're anticipating, but I'll get into a little bit of the detail. There are some really, obviously this is a hard nut to crack. If it was easy, it would have already been cracked. Um, and so let's just acknowledge that. It's not that these problems are um, you know, just low hanging fruit. These are complicated, but I'll get into the complexity here. I just want to, um, on the last slide, I was thinking, you know, our, my perspective is youth development, youth workforce development, and in that 7% in the of skills training, you've got in that whole pie youth workforce development, which includes FYP, and I just want to note that for 14, 15, 16, 17 year old, we have a lot of data from economists and more recent data coming out that the commission has uh, Reference, I think, at the previous yep. meeting, like it does, it, it is a skill building activity for sure, young people. That, so, for you, the candy, but the seven million, the seven percent does not include that's why you The seven percent does not include that's why you that And that, I guess that's my point. Okay. That it is a, it's a different kind of skill training. I don't think it should be included in the seven percent, but I just wanted to make a notation. Sure, so yeah, that yeah. is skills building for young people. For young people, we do see different, so I think one of the things that's really important about subsidized jobs is understanding for whom do they work. And so you're making a, a strong case, which commissioners made in the task force as well, which is that one of the, there are certain populations for whom subsidized jobs can work really well, and we want to use evidence-based to make sure that those programs continue and that are strengthened. Um, and I think you'll see some of your recommendations as well around um, more private sector um, skill building around youth uh, subsidized jobs because you see the, the strong correlation with that exposure. I think that there's been a, um, but yeah, no, you, you, I mean, you, you make a good point. We were trying to, again, you know, it's hard to get it 100% right when you're trying to make these big statements. Um, the majority of the system obviously trying to focus on folks that are either unemployed or. Um, so this is the current state versus the future state. So I won't spend too long in the current state.
little bit about this, but the future state. So we really want a sector focus from our system fill, uh, on filling quality jobs in high value sectors and creating pathways. Um, we want a core strategy that focuses on career development, supported by strategic investments in training, education, and retention services. We want job quality. So this is a, we want services and incentives and policies that are targeted to support businesses that offer full-time consistent living wage work. We want connection to the city's investments, so mandated hiring, we'll talk some more about that, um, and ongoing training options. And we want internal alignment that involve common metrics, shared definitions, and a unified approach to employers and job seeker customers, including branding. So, here's a long one. Uh, I will not read every single word on this, but I, because I'm going to go into it. Um, and obviously, if you uh, enjoyed the executive summary, uh, which is online, if you go to www.nyc.gov backslash career pathways, you can click on the executive summary by itself, you know, it's all online. Um, it so, we really have three main areas, building skills employers seek, improving job quality, and coordinating systems. And we have 10 specific recommendations, you're familiar with these kinds of uh, reports. But the big one that I will spend a moment on, um, just at the top to kind of frame it out, is launching and expanding industry partnerships with real-time feedback loops and establishing career pathways as a framework for the city's workforce system. So career pathways is not something um, that we thought of in this task force. It is something that both nationally um, and around the country, there are certainly, there are, OTDOF has a couple career pathways uh, grants currently here. There are career pathways CUNY has a grant of career pathways. It's a term that's being used, which really mean upward mobility and trying to stack credentials over time. And so we're saying if we reframe all of our work around upward mobility and moving over time, that that would be the effective way we'd like to do that. And the only way you can do that um, is when you actually have industry information. You can build the idea of career pathways without industry, and what will happen is that well, you'll actually train train people or you'll move people along and there won't be any business. So all of this is contingent on really understanding businesses and really understanding what industry needs and where labor is constrained to growth and how we can move people into this kind of work. So the industry partnership, um, we've chosen six sectors to focus on. And for different reasons. So, for example, we've got two in high growth sectors. So we see healthcare technology that have high growth and high wages. Um, and the focus there would be around skill development. So, for example, we've got the New York Alliance for Careers in Healthcare, NIH. Um, and it has um, been in development for several years, public and privately funded, um, and working very strongly with labor and um, 1199 SEIU and partnering with all of effective partnership, it's really been able to find out where labor is constrained to growth and where they can effectively invest or create new training that may not have existed at all, create new programs that may not have existed at all, that really allow people to enter and grow. And now we also have the Tech Talent Pipeline, which has just been launched. The next four have not started, but will be. These are sectors with opportunities for higher wage jobs, um, construction and industrial. So this also is where we can connect to some of our economic development investments. We know that with our housing plan and with the um, investments that we have in both the Navy Yard, both in our internal, as well as private investments in manufacturing and making, that we see um, that there is new, new uh, opportunity here. Even though the numbers might say that the growth in industrial and construction might be low. They might only say it's 4%, but we know that because of this other investment, we see more jobs, and we see that labor could be a constraint to growth as well as space, and that's why the city's investing in those in technology. So the focus here would be training and apprenticeships to integrate disadvantaged lower income New Yorkers to high city investments. So, for example, a new industrial partnership that was called for in the report, the expansion of the existing workforce one uh, industrial transportation, and we connect services to innovative manufacturing centers, which involves our larger manufacturing strategy. And then in low wage sectors, retail and food service. Um, there are certainly um, lots of ways to improve job quality. And there are, you know, as we know, there's strong unions in retail and in food 
service as well, which have done incredible work around Macy's before, and may have seen some great articles recently reported about Macy's, which is fantastic. Um, but the idea of a retail partnership where we can do employer education campaigns, employer-based financial empowerment, and technical assistance for small businesses so they can improve their business practices and help um, raise the floor for them. Which can be so stable scheduling, um, ability to get strong supervision, figuring out how to move um, within or um, even out of a certain um, future transferable skills out of a uh, specific uh, company. These are our industry partnerships. So we'll be developing in partnership with our agencies. And then we invest in training and skill upgrades for job seekers and workers. So this is the first one is creating bridge programs to develop job ready skill sets. So it's really important that in a career pathways framework we're not you know leaving anyone behind or we're not investing in high skilled training that uh, might be tenth grade or, or higher as a as an entry point. We need to also make sure that we're creating bridges to bridges to now this has always been a challenge because we do have uh, federal requirements that, that want to see a graduation within a year, want to see um, you know, other requirements. So we're going to need to really stretch and push ourselves as well as push the requirements that we have to really make sure that we can invest in some of these great bridge programs. There's a couple examples um, innovative here in New York City that are privately funded, such as the GP Bridge to Help, help at LaGuardia. And this is contextualized learning or co-teaching, some of these um, ideas, right? And so uh, Bob Parker could also speak about those. I mean, and the idea here is that we have some great um, programming at UAC, at DOE. How do we um, add some of these effective elements to those as well as uh, figure out how to, so we can move it at scale, right? So we don't have some that are bridge and some, you know, they all can get it. Yes, we use the term investment. <coughs> who've been around for a while, the whole issue about rapid attachment to the workforce has always been problematic. That being said, do you have any sense at all whether or not the city recognizes that there are a group of people, that's what they want. And what they want is want and need a job now. And yes, I want to plan for the future. Yes, I want to be on a career path, but the bottom line is I have financial responsibilities, I need a job now, I recognize that it's not a lot of money, I don't know how long I'm going to stay there. It, it, because that's just the reality. That's just the reality. I mean, we, these programs are, um, if you, only a part of the whole piece. We're not saying all $500 million goes into training and we stop and close down all the workforce work center centers and that, you know, and that, that it's not possible. 
you know, we have these programming, um, we have these federal dollars which emphasize rapid attachment and we need to figure out ways that we can create more diverse offerings, um, but there will still be um, an emphasis on people who are currently unemployed getting them into work. But the point is also not to leave them there, which is oh, why. I, I, I agree. Which I mean, in the, in the ultimate yeah, sense, this but this is easy. <laughs> um, it would be it would be hard. So we, we want to acknowledge the great work and the learnings from um, UICD and SBS and the and CEO, which invested in the last several years here in New York City in some really innovative sector models, which really moved people up, and we can really see the difference between, um, it, you know, in fact, the Westat study really has some clear differences between um, those that might have gone to Workforce One. Um, and gotten attached versus those that went to a sector workforce one versus those that got trained in the sector workforce. So we can see some of those differences over time from some of the great work that's already been that we're building on here. Katie, one of the struggles I know for our agencies has been the Thank you. 
You have your question? Ah, uh, it's okay. Uh, this, is a, this is an exciting one. Um, so first we're talking about mandating a first look process. So a first look process is not mandating, you have to hire Katie Gall to be, she, you know, is as an accountant, I would not recommend with the city, and that we need to look through our system and try to find someone who's qualified. And if we find someone who's qualified, we'll send them on to you, and that you would then have an opportunity to take a look at our candidates first. So that's what it's all about. That's all city contractors? This will be, ideally, as we as we go through everything, it would be getting to all city contractors. Now, you're in the social service contract. You're a little different. Yeah, I was going to say nonprofits as well. Or, yeah, well, yeah. social service contracts have different um, have different obligation. You actually have a mandated hiring obligation at every two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to hire or retain your city. Um, so that's different because that's expanding targeted hiring and social service contracts. Um, but for those that are not social service contracts, we have talking about this first look process. San Francisco has a first look process. Mm -hmm. Several other municipalities have these first look processes, um, and we are encouraged by the results. We see this as a very business friendly. It's not a punitive action. It's a really a service to businesses trying to find them qualified people quickly that can be helpful to their business. So it's really important that this is delivered in a way that uh, we're only sending candidates who are qualified and doing it in a quick way that is business friendly. Are, are those direct contracts with businesses as opposed to, for example, a human service agency hires a con hires a RISPA, you know, whatever to come? It, it, is it a, a direct City contract and a yeah, whatever. direct, a direct, direct only contract. direct, not not indirect. Uh, this, let's, let's get there first. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's okay. probably a, um, you know but what we need to do is we need to start with the contracts that we have um, and move forward. With it. There's that that's the first first step. Can you develop these like um, franchises to the like, city bike program or things like that, which gives somebody. Yeah, so employers doing business with the city. So we're needing, so the first step that we have in our um, implementation plan is defining the thresholds of what is doing business and finding with our um, um, teams, you know, what would be, when would be qualified for a first look and then we'll be rolling it out. So probably lots of different things. We do have quite a few um, goods and services contracts, which we need differently than, I mean, obviously our uh, infrastructure contracts, which we need differently than our City bike relationships, and so we have, there's lots of fun <laughs> in this one. Um, but again, it's, this is a idea that um, the mayor and the commissioners are very committed to, but it's complex. Development infrastructure to improve coordination. So building a system-wide data infrastructure um, involves establishing common set of metrics and definitions across agencies. Now this is, for you guys who really understand this, you understand how complicated this is. You have your own funding streams that might be beyond the city. You have your own definitions. Um, but as providers, you have been asking, some of you have been asking for, you know, I have a uh, contract with DICD, it's different than the kind of contract I have with HRA, it's different than the contract I have with ACS. And we think about common metrics that would apply uh, no matter what funding stream that the city cares about. And then improve the quality of services. This is the idea of we have lots of um, kind of alphabet soup here of brands, and we want to when we work with businesses as well as the job seekers have one brand that we can speak with. So this is a it won't be called a brand. The idea is to, to get somebody who's smart and flashy to think about what it would be, um, and then have the city have uh, speak with one voice rather than a lot of different. Things that can be very confusing both to businesses as well as to job seekers. Katie, can you just say something about that? Yes. Um, uh, one is, like, I guess I agree in terms mm -hmm. of the one brand, but one thing that I do want to raise, and I don't know whether it's been, I, I don't represent anyone that I'm talking about. The prior administration made, made a decision uh, around a variety of different services that there would be a one brand around a narrow piece. And it struck me as being short-sighted not to give credit to the contractors 
who were running the service. So that if you walk into certain parts of the workforce system, it would say, you know, the New York City, blah, 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 and whatever this was called. But it never identified who was running the service. And I've always thought that it was short-sighted, not the big part, I, you know, the, the one branding. But what it didn't do was give a credit, if you will, to the local organization that was running it, which many people in different communities respect and feel a sense of identity to, and may or may not sense an identity to the city. So I'm just suggesting that when this happens, is to look at that. Definitely the, the, the one brand, definitely to say this is New York City, but if the ABC organization in Brownsville is running a particular program, and if the city thinks that that organization was good enough to get that contract, people respond to that. People say, oh, I know the ABC organization, and I trust them. So that's just a recommendation. Um, and I don't know if now maybe it's a good time to transition. Um, these are just the recommendations that are focused around youth and I might let. Um, if there are no more questions on the overall plan, I'll, I just have two slides up here, and they reflect the Research. Uh, we found some good examples uh, in Washington State, Illinois, Minnesota, obviously some of the ones that were mentioned, LaGuardia, uh, 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 the Bronx, uh, looking at first of model for the type of field. So there's a lot of good examples. We're trying to find something that's appropriate in your city uh, that uh, can expand on and go on. And, um, you know, that's, that's what we know so far. You'll see a concept paper. The other, the other thing that we're really excited about is the um, uh, to summer youth employment. As you know, summer youth employment, we, we kind of like earn attention of quality and quantity, right? 
So we have to serve as many people as we can because we get 130,000 plus applications every year. But at the same time, we want to make it a quality experience where it actually needs to sign. Now, we've already seen some initial uh, success where those relate to better academic uh, attendance and, and improvement in their academics in the school, in the school, school years following the uh, summer job. But what about the young people who, you know, maybe after high school, they're not necessarily going to go to college, but they do serve on page 24. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the recommendations is to improve the work based experience. And what does that mean? For us, we look at where are, let's look at the growth centers. You know, where are the jobs that young people can access? Where are the jobs where they can get, they should get some experience, even for, if it's for six weeks or 14 weeks. So a lot of those growth sectors are within the private sector. So for the last several years, we've had um, roughly about 30% of our employers in some years of work program in the private sector. And, and they range, you know, there's definitely some healthcare jobs, very few IT jobs because it's only in the short term. But how do we build upon that? And I think that that's something that I know that this group has uh, been told, and I know some of you are already working with us on that too expand the number of private sector placements, in particular in some of these work centers. So, uh, Anthony wants to add more to that. Um, yeah, so at the last meeting, I know we had um, asked for some volunteers to do the work. So just to give a little update on that, um, uh, several of you have you know, identified yourselves who are on this work group uh, of youth or youth council have come together to just think about how to launch this campaign for youth council can be involved in, in, in approaching private sector employers and uh, persuading them to be private sector work sites. Now I think we at DRC know that while the Youth for Youth Council can be part of this ask to these employers, but we can't do this by ourselves. So I know that the WIV has expressed interest in this involvement in outreach to employers. Uh, I think we have also had some initial conversations with SBS and EDC to leverage their employer relationships. And you know, We've set out an ambitious goal, and it's really an internal goal, I think, after thinking it through and after uh, looking at the work of the task force that you know, the internal goal is to try to raise that uh, you know, up to 55% by the end of the mayor's first term, but that's, that's a goal, and it's an internal goal, um, and that we definitely want to get started in that direction. So, uh, you know, the work group had an initial meeting to talk about some of the, the strategies of what the campaign looks like. Um, they really charged us at DYC to come back to them uh, with some ideas about you know, communications and messaging, and, and these are some things that they need to talk to some of our other partners about as well. Uh, and also, you know, we have 50 providers that are part of the SYH program, so we want to make sure that they're integrated in the outreach as well. So there are some operational impacts, you know, to us if we're going to get this um, influx of referrals, how that will impact, you know, our agencies operating with SYEP uh, annually. So these are things that we're all looking at. Um, we're going to have a follow-up meeting with the workers to report back to them on some of uh, what we've been looking at internally. Um, and then, you know, I think our goal is shortly in New Year to be able to uh, come and speak to all the partners about the campaign, what it looks like, and then how, you know, you can start reaching out to your employers and what that strategy will be in terms of the employers you have in your um, you know, any of the work group members on the Youth Work Youth Council, if there's anything you want to add to that, you know, I invite like to um, Tom, that's great, Liz, Nancy, great. Well, I'll just say, I think one of the challenges that we identified was, um, number one, who are, who are private sector employers? We had a big discussion about that. And then, um, what is the goal? And who are the kids that are most, so it's one thing just to say that, but then the, the next question comes, so who are these kids and what do we want them to get from this experience that they wouldn't? And where are the places that they could get that experience? And sometimes we use the magic, like it's a private sector or a place like that's going to be so much better. It might or might not. A hospital which is not, may or may not be considered private sector or a university or the museum of art. Um, those places might be there. Anyway, you get the point. So I think that we would try and think, what is it that we want them to get? because we know when we enter this field, it takes a lot more hand-holding like we've done with the school leaders. And so are we really saying, let's 
double the number of ladders to lead us for this year, or quadruple, or, you know, anyway, you don't have the answer right now, but those are some of the questions that we raised. That but you're right, private yeah. sector can mean different things. So I have a meeting this Friday with the Public Affairs Commissioner. He's, he's asking for my help in trying to bring cultural activities into uh, public housing community centers. I want his help to get every museum and every public institution to hire a young person. That's like you. Right. And sometimes working in a museum is probably a better experience than maybe working in a small business. It depends on, again, the, the development of the jobs. And so I think you're right. I think uh, Darren Block, who's the executive director of the Mayor's Fund, has said that he has spoken to uh, Catherine Wild in the partnership, and she has expressed her interest in helping promote the Latin leaders, which would be great because we know every year we get many more young people who apply and you cannot place because it's employer driven. It's, you know, we do, and it's what's effectively do outreach to get the cream of the crop in many communities of color. So, uh, and the idea of Latin leaders can have a conversation, meet, a meeting that that Jean Mulgrav and I had with Kathy Wild like six or seven years ago where she said she, her members, understandably, do not want to hire a young person who was picked for the lottery. They want to have the role right. in making that decision. So Lattice for Leaders was designed specifically in response to that concern, is that we really do intensive job readiness, training, boot camp, resume writing, interview skills, and we send them out into the real world and they get hired, or they don't get hired. Um, so if Kathy Wild's on board, I think, we really can really uh, expand Lattice for Leaders because it's really less about money and more about the job placements. Um, the other strategy that uh, Anthony talked about was the SBS, so the sure there has been very supportive. And I think we want to look at where are young people working now, which neighborhoods are already working in small businesses, and then build on that and say to when we meet with the Chamber of Commerce's and Business Improvement Districts, these young people are already living in your neighborhood, they're working in the businesses that your members of your member of businesses. Let's make this a more systematic effort and sort of, again, push. So when we're thinking about this, the private sector targeting older youth, those that are 17, 18, 19, because I think we want to accept possible match their interest with uh, the job. Uh, obviously, for 14, 15, 16 year olds, it's just basic skills. I mean, my first job ever was at 14, working for Two Bridges Neighborhood Council, cleaning out empty lots. And they taught me showing up on time, working as a team, and following instructions. I mean, basic skills that you need at 14, 15, 16. But at 17, 18, 19, and 20, you obviously want to align a young person's interest with um, what, you know, what the job will offer them. So I think we're going to be much more nuanced as we start to roll this out. But I think I want to match people's expectations. This summer will be a high list. So, I'm not looking for thousands of job placements. If we get 100 to 200 quality job placements in the private sector, build the relationships, build the systems, build the marketing material, and then really push for 2016. 2016. Summer 2016. I, I think I'll we'll start in terms of the committee that there were two, there were two other things that, that we all emphasized. Number one, where does the outreach to businesses for youth, where does that fit into the larger picture of outreach to businesses for other groups of people? And so back to the issue of one brand, is that not to do our best. In New York City, we're never going to be able to not, you know, not trip over each other. That being said, is that to really focus on what, what are we doing here in terms of this particular group and the staff at DYCD and what's happening to all the other programs for adults, for everybody else in terms of dealing with employers. So one was that we really wanted to emphasize in any way that we could help with that, but to really press that that needs to be talked about. And the second piece, uh, another piece that we talked about as well, is um, anything that we could do as a group to be able to, meaning the working group, to be able to help DYCD deal with employers so that that is a smooth transition. The last thing that anybody wants is to have someone bitch about the fact that they called such and such a number and someone didn't know what they were talking about or was confusing. And so one of the things I had said to Anthony is use us, uh, use us in a way, if the door's locked, as a focus group to be able to, or whatever it is, to call on the phone, to do whatever it is, and that's not to embarrass 
or do anything with DYCD, but rather to make the system as tight as possible so that no employer says something negative, what they say is something positive. Isn't it incredible we dealt with the city and they came through? That's what, that's what we want. It, so we're looking forward to as a I committee. I'll talk the second point, maybe Katie talked about the, the mm -hmm. first point. On the, on the second point, uh, you know, Daphne, uh, right. uh, for many years, yeah. when Ladders Collegiate was an in-house program, right. that was her full-time job yes. along with her staff. Right. So she will continue to do that. Yeah. As, you, as we bring in more, uh, particularly corporate employers, right. Daphne will be uh, responsible for maintaining this yeah. relationship, troubleshooting if there are issues between the Ladders Collegiate providers, Right. And, and the employers, but you're right, nurturing the, the relationship with employers, particularly corporate employers, is important. For the uh, one, the jobs that are get generated through SBS and the business division, we want to connect the local SYP providers to the businesses. Right. Because I think the more geographically linked, organic it is, the better. But I think corporate, corporate employers, I think we do have to have a very centralized strategy, and, and Daphne and her staff will be taking the lead on that. Yeah, I mean, we um, to be to also to come. Um, we didn't we sort of um, talk a little bit about it in the report, but not uh, very specifically. We are interested in figuring out ways that we can help this office can help coordinate youth workforce strategy, uh, just like um, but, but acknowledging the youth workforce strategy is going to uh, take unique positions, uh, understand that it's going to be different. Um, as needed. So um, we're helping to try to develop with the um, Mayor's Fund a uh, work office workforce, uh, youth workforce strategy with a Commissioner John uh, Blessing and, and input. And so we are also we'll be thinking about how to do this systemically, which obviously we've already got this great relationship with commissioners and, and, the, and the partnership and everything already happening. So that's the kind of um, great work that would be supported. I think it's obviously everyone still doing it.
Kevin, in light of your vacancy for vice chair, I'd like to recommend that one of the youth board members nominate one of our youth representatives as vice chair. We've never had a young person be in a leadership role on the youth board. And uh, especially in light of Katie's presentation, I know um, Priscilla, for example, was involved in bringing STEM activities to SYAP workers. And uh, I don't think, I don't know if I can formally nominate, but that would be my recommendation. We'll, we'll have a discussion with Priscilla about uh, that role. And we'll get back to Thank you. <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> so, I think that's it. I think we're closing. And just a reminder, we will be in touch with youth board members about our special meeting in January to elect the rest of the executive committee. And also to be in touch with you just to get feedback and also uh, recommendations for the youth board for 2015. So, everybody have a happy holiday season, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.